and let us pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. May he bless it to us. As we begin to consider this passage, I think of my grandfather, who was a great pillar of faith in my family, that he lived a life of great service to others, but especially service to the Lord. And uh, this was clear not only to those who were believers, but this was clear even to those who were unbelievers. Even unbelievers would look in on his life and see he clearly lived a life of service. He clearly lived to serve others. He clearly lived to serve his Savior. However, the last couple of years of my grandfather's life were, were plagued by Parkinson's disease that he suffered greatly at the end of his life, and it eventually, uh, eventually led to his death. And some of those, especially the unbelievers who were looking in on his life from the outside, looked at his service in his life, his service to others, and his service to the Lord, and thought, what reward does he get for that? Look at the suffering that his life ended with. Look at how he finished his life. What kind of reward is that for his faithful service? And this is something that in our passage, Paul is calling us not to give in to this kind of despair. That our suffering in this life, our suffering as Christians, is not something to be ashamed of. That the suffering of Christ himself is not something to be ashamed of, but rather it is glorious. It is what brings about our salvation. And so as we consider this passage, we will see that Paul calls us to unashamed suffering in light of the sure hope we have in Christ. And we'll consider this passage in three main points. Paul's call in verse 8, Christ's work in verses 9 through 10, and Paul's confession in verses 11 through 12. And so we'll begin to consider this passage by looking at verse 8 and considering Paul's call. Paul starts out verse 8 with, uh, in your English translations with the word therefore. And if we start a passage with therefore, we need to know what came before our passage. What Paul is saying here is going to be grounded and what he has just said. And so in summary, what Paul has said so far in 2 Timothy is that he has recognized Timothy's faith, that Timothy has faith in Christ, the same faith that dwelt in his mother and his grandmother. But beyond that, he recognizes that just as, every, just as is the case for every believer, Timothy has been given the Holy Spirit, who is a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And so when Paul starts off this passage with therefore, what he's saying is, since you have faith in Christ, 
since you have been given the spirit of power, love, and self-control, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But the first question that we come to here is why would one be ashamed of Christ? And why would some, someone be ashamed of Paul? First off, why would one be ashamed of Christ? Well, first off, Christ's life was marked by great shame from the world's perspective. That Christ lived a life of servitude and suffering. As we see in Isaiah 53, as Isaiah prophesied about Christ, Christ is said to be despised and rejected by man. This was the case for Christ in his life on earth, that he was despised and rejected. He was not upheld. He was not accepted by many. In fact, his life ended, so it seemed, in death on a cross as a criminal. That when uh, many of the early Christians were trying to teach the gospel, one of the greatest stumbling blocks to unbelievers was that they served a crucified Savior. They served someone who was put to death as a criminal. That from the outside looking in, all they saw was someone, were a bunch of followers, fanatics, who followed this crucified criminal. And so, Paul, and so Christ's life, his life of servitude, suffering, and eventual death, from the outside looks to be very shameful. Why might one be ashamed of Paul? Well, uh, Paul's life, similarly, after he became a Christian, also was filled with a fair share of sufferings. And we get a, a long list of these sufferings, if you want to look it up, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. Paul goes on and on about the sufferings that he received as a Christian. That by the time you get to the end of this list, you're, you're wondering, is Paul ever going to finish? Is, is he ever going to be done with all of the sufferings that he's gone through for the gospel? And sometimes when we see lives like Paul's, our first instinct is not to jump in and to help, but sometimes our first instinct is to look away because it's hard to look at. When someone is going through such deep sorrow and suffering, sometimes it's hard to look at and we look away. We look away in shame. And this is exactly why Paul is, is calling us not to be ashamed. We are not to be ashamed of the suffering of our Lord. We are not to be ashamed of the suffering of Paul or of any believer. But what's interesting is Paul moves on and takes his exhortation even further. He doesn't just say, don't be ashamed of the Lord's suffering. Don't be ashamed of my suffering. But rather, join in it. He says, share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. The very thing that one might be ashamed of in Christ and might be ashamed of in Paul is what we as believers are called to share in. Suffering for the gospel. And this is something that has been the case, that we can see is, is the case throughout Scripture. We can think of uh, what Peter says in 1 Peter 2.21, that because Christ suffered for us and left us such an example, we also have been called to suffer. Or even the words of our Lord in John 15, where Christ tells us that no servant is greater than their master. If they persecuted Christ, so also they will persecute us. This is what we have been called to, 
as Christians to suffer for the gospel, to suffer together. And this is why Paul doesn't just say, but suffer for the gospel by the power of God. He says, share in suffering. He, ha- he, he had the Greek word for suffering, but he put in front of it a prefix meaning to sh- suffer together, to share in suffering, that our suffering is not something that we only go through by ourselves or alone, but our suffering for the gospel is seen to be communal. First off, our suffering for the gospel is part of our union with Christ, that we are called to share in His sufferings. That when we suffer, we suffer for Christ's sake, who suffered on our behalf. But even beyond that, our sufferings are also part of our unity with each other as the body of Christ, that we suffer together as God's people. And so this exhortation to share in suffering is not just an exhortation to suffer for the gospel, but also to share in the sufferings of our fellow believers. That when we are going through difficult times, we are not to keep them to ourselves, but we are to call on the help of other believers. That we are to bear one another's burdens. Similarly, when we see our fellow believers going through troubling times, we are to join in their suffering, to bear their burdens. But beyond that, this bearing of each other's burdens would not be enough for us to get through the suffering that comes upon us in this life. And this is why Paul says that we are sharing in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. That if we were to only rely on each other, or to only rely on our own strength, we could not get through these sufferings. Rather, our suffering is meant to be only sustained through the power of God. We cannot bear these sufferings of our own strength. We rely on God to empower us to endure these sufferings. And we know that Scripture tells us God will not allow any suffering to come upon us that He cannot deliver us from. But we must rely on Him. He is the only one who can actually deliver us from our sufferings. And it is even by the power of God that we can have a right view of our sufferings. And this is why Paul moves on in verses 9 through 10 to talk about Christ's work. Because part of the right of having a right view of our suffering for the gospel is to think of our suffering in light of the great salvation God has brought to us through Christ. And so as we look at Christ's work in verses 9 through 10, first off, we hear that we have been saved and called by God, and that God has saved us and called us to a holy calling. We can suffer for the gospel because we know that it is through this gospel that we have been saved, that we know that this gospel is actually worth suffering for. This gospel is the message through which we are saved, that Christ's work, as, as shown in the gospel, is the means by which we are saved. Similarly, we have been called to a holy life, and among other things, part of this holy life is the suffering that Paul is speaking of, that part of our holy life as Christians is to suffer for the sake of the gospel. However, we're not left to this suffering But God has saved us and called us, but He has not saved us because of our works, as Paul says, but because of His own purpose and grace. And this is something that we hear all the time in Reformed churches. 
that we are saved not by works, but by grace. But it's something that we have to continually hear. Because so often, we desire to be justified by our works. So often, we desire to put our works forward as part of the means of our salvation. So often, we think that we can add something to our salvation by what we do. But Paul wants to be exceedingly clear here. It is not by works. In fact, the only works we did before we were saved were evil works, nowhere near meriting salvation. And the works we do now, as Christians, including our suffering for the sake of the gospel, are not contributing at all to our salvation, but are works of thankfulness for the salvation that has already been accomplished. And therefore, we are saved not by works, but by God's own purpose and grace. It is wholly because of God's good pleasure that we are saved. But Paul goes on to speak of God's good pleasure and His purpose, saying that this purpose and grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. This similarly makes it even clearer that it's not based on works, that this purpose and grace was given to us in Christ before we had done anything good or evil, that God already purposed to save us through Christ Jesus. How wonderful to know that God has always had a plan to save us. And, this was, uh, and to, to say that this plan was Christ Jesus before the ages began is to make it clear that Christ was not plan B. That God didn't uh, decide that Christ would be the way we are saved after the fall in the garden. That God didn't decide Christ was the way we'd be saved after the Mosaic law didn't work out. But this was God's plan from the very beginning. That Christ has only ever been the only plan by which anyone is saved. Before the ages began, Christ was put forward as the one through whom all people who are saved are saved. But this salvation, although God purposed it before the ages began, He purposed that it would come at a specific time in human history. In verse 10, Paul says, speaking of this purpose and grace, he says, in which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Although it was before the world began that God planned out our salvation, He planned out that it would come through the incarnation of Christ. And so we can fully see the purpose and grace of God concerning our salvation as we look back to the coming of our Savior, Christ Jesus. And what did Christ do in His coming? Paul points out three specific things that He did. Paul says that He abolished death and He brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That these three things are specific things that Christ did in His work on earth. First off, that he abolished death. And what's helpful to think of these three things is to look at what Heidelberg 45, what the Heidelberg Catechism 45 states regarding the benefits that we receive from Christ's resurrection. Because what Heidelberg 45 answers as the first benefit of Christ's resurrection is that by his resurrection, he has overcome death so that he might make us share in the righteousness he obtained for us by his death. And so, firstly, the first benefit of Christ's resurrection is that he has overcome death. And as Paul says here, he has abolished death. 
that death holds no power over Christ because although Christ did die, he did not stay dead. We do not serve only a crucified Savior, but we serve a crucified and raised to life Savior. And we, being united to Christ, can also say that death has been abolished for us. That since Christ has abolished death, we too need not fear death, for it has been abolished for us. Paul then goes on to speak about life and immortality. Now, sometimes these two things are construed to be just one blessing, but I think it's more helpful to see these as two distinct blessings of Christ's work on earth. And I think they're the, they're the two other blessings of Christ's resurrection. Because in Heidelberg 45, the second blessing of Christ's resurrection is that by His power, we too are already raised to a new life. This is the life that Paul speaks of. That Christ has brought life to us such that not only do we have life to look forward to, but we have new life now through the Spirit. That we have been regenerated. We have been born again. Our affections have changed such that we don't only desire that which is evil, but now we actually desire to do the will of God. This is the new life that Christ has already given us now. But then Paul goes on to speak of the immortality that Christ has brought to life through the gospel. And again, this is the third benefit that we see in Heidelberg 45, that Christ's resurrection is a sure pledge to us of our blessed resurrection, that we can look forward to the fact that we will be raised immortal because of Christ's work, that Christ has brought immortality to light such that all who are united to him through true faith, after they die, will be raised immortal. And so by Christ working in the gospel, death is abolished for us. We have new life even now, and we look forward to immortal, eternal life after death. But Paul then goes on, in light of the great glories of the gospel, as Paul has spoken of, Paul moves on in verses 11 through 12 to talk once again about the themes of suffering and shame. And this is Paul's confession in verses 11 through 12, which starts with recognizing that this gospel that he has just defined is the same gospel for which he was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why he suffers as he does. For this gospel, Paul was appointed, and therefore, he suffers. And we see throughout the New Testament the great fruits of Paul's labors as a minister. However, it's not the great fruits that we would think of that Paul highlights here, but rather it's something else that he calls to mind. He calls to mind the sufferings that he has gone through in his calling as a minister. Paul suffers because he is faithful to his calling. And the truth is, if we think back to those um, that were looking at my grandfather's life and thinking, what a waste of, of all of that service, what a waste of all of that service when there was no reward. The truth is, those people are right if we have no hope in Christ beyond this life. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But this is why it's glorious that Paul goes on here in verse 12 
because he has called us to not be ashamed of Christ's suffering. He has called us not to be ashamed of his suffering or of the sufferings of any believer. He's even called us to suffer for the gospel. But here, he makes his own personal confession, recognizing why exactly we cannot be ashamed. Because Paul says here, But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have Believe it, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Paul calls us not to be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or, him, or of himself, but Paul himself tells us why he is not ashamed. Because he has believed in Christ. He knows that Christ himself suffered in his place for his salvation. He knows that Christ himself calls him to suffer as part of his union with Christ. And he also knows that Christ's suffering was the very thing that brought about his salvation. That in, in Paul's suffering, he knows that this suffering is not going to be the end of my life. This suffering is not going to in any way threaten my salvation. But rather, Paul is convinced that Christ is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to him. That Paul is absolutely certain that even in the midst of his suffering, even in the midst of these trials, that Christ is guarding his salvation. That we as believers, in the midst of our own sufferings, in the midst of our trials and temptations, can know that these sufferings have no bearing on our salvation. That these sufferings cannot take us out of the Father's hand. that Christ will keep us in the salvation He has won for us. And so, in conclusion, I'd like to read some from Heidelberg 27 and 28. Because these remind us, these Heidelberg questions and answers remind us of what God has done for us such that in our sufferings we can have a sure, a sure hope in the salvation that Christ has won for us. Because in Heidelberg 27, when speaking about the providence of God, we, we read that God rules the world in such a way that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, including sufferings, come to us not by chance, but by our God's fatherly hand. And 28, talking about the knowledge of God's creation and providence and how it helps us, we know that we can be patient in adversity And for the future, we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that no creature will separate us from His love. For all creatures are so completely in His hand that without His will, they can neither move nor be moved. Therefore, be encouraged that in the midst of your sufferings, nothing can take you out of the Father's hand. Nothing can take you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. These trials and these sufferings are not news to God. God is not unaware of them. They didn't take Him by surprise. And they cannot thwart His plans for your salvation. Similarly, when we look to the sufferings of Christ and we look to the sufferings of our fellow Christians, let us not be ashamed, but recognize 
that it is through Christ's suffering that we are saved, and that our sufferings and the sufferings of other believers are part of our union with Christ and His sufferings, and our suffering is for the same gospel by which we are saved. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously grant that your word which we have heard may be inscribed inwardly on our hearts. As we receive your word meekly, with pure affection, may our hearts be filled with love and reverence for you. Cause us to bear the fruit of the Spirit and to live in holiness, diligently following your commandments. And may it please you to use us to lead those who are lost, wandering and confused, into the way of truth. All this we pray for the honor and praise of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.